Welcome to Embedded. I am Alicia White, alongside Christopher White. You may have heard about my origami obsession. So when I heard about a professor doing paper machines, imagine what I imagined. I am so pleased to have Professor Hyun Ju from Georgia Tech here to talk to us. Hi, Hyun Ju. Hello. Could you tell us about yourself as if we met at a paper craft conference? Do they have those? Yes, of course they do. Okay. <laughs> sure. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Hyun Ju. I'm a designer, engineer, um, and or maker. And um, I'm also an assistant professor um, working at Georgia Tech and leading CodeCraft uh, research group. Um, my group works on um, developing computational design tools and methods that support um, integrating computing with um, everyday craft materials, including, of course, paper. Um, does, it, does it sound enough? Yes. <laughs> I can go on and on, but well, let's we stop have here. more to talk about. <laughs> Um, but before we do that, we want to do lightning round where we ask you short questions and we're hoping for short answers. And if we're behaving ourselves, we won't ask how and why. Are you sure? Are you ready? Yep, I'm ready. What is your favorite kind of paper? Ooh, um, um, copy paper. Really? Yep. Cheap one. The cheaper, the better. And everybody has it. Uh, do you have a favorite small motor? Um, I have that, um, <laughs> um, like, everywhere, but I don't know where <laughs> those are really from. I would just say, you know, same thing, the cheaper, the better. Do you like to complete one project or start a dozen? Oh, um, start one project and complete one project. Absolutely. If you wrote a book, what would it be about? Designing for Curiosity. Ooh, that's a great title. <laughs> that's actually a title of a course I'm teaching at Georgia Tech. Uh, do you have a favorite mechanical mechanism? I guess that's redundant. Do you have a favorite mechanism? <laughs> <laughs> um, should I pick just one? You can pick as many as you like. I guess I, I have such an objection to all sorts of mechanical movements. Um, like my favorite one would be, you know, rack and pinion. Um, yeah. Do you have a favorite paper craft sensor? Um, you know, because it's related to my field of study, <laughs> I guess the question can be really unfolded in, in multiple dimensions. I would say as long as I can um, read all sorts of, you know, behaviors with paper, um, I just love them all. Well, I mean, to be fair, I asked you the question partially because you have this mm. fantastic new project out um, where you talk about how to build an analog flex sensor, an analog potentiometer, a digital contact, a uh, capacitive <laughs> touch, an analog pressure. And I was just like, you can do all of that with copper tape and paper? Yep. Yep. You don't have a favorite one of those? If I pick just one out of those, um, um, bend sensor um, made of kind of um, inkjet printer with silver ink that we can just print out uh, on kind of uh, photo paper. And then uh, we can transfer what's printed on paper using tape. Um, and then, you know, it comes complete that with, with circuitry to read any form of, you know, deformation, including bending. Okay. So there were so many things in there. Lightning round is over. <laughs> I know, Light, I know. Oh, yeah, it was obviously. <laughs> there, okay. So silver ink in, 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 in inkjet printers? Yes. Silver nanoparticle ink. Yes, uh, we can uh, use any sort of kind of inkjet printer, but instead of putting, you know, color color ink, 
uh, we can kind of put those silver nanoparticle ink. Uh, it's not what we, my group, invented. This is one of the um, one of you know the techniques used in DIY and HCI community. Um, yeah, it, it's it, it kind of used the the commodity commodity tool like inkjet printer, but we kind of add silver ink. Do, are there are there cartridges of silver ink, or do I have to do something? probably cheaper than normal ink? <laughs> yeah, to be fair, uh, silver ink is not um, really cheap, I should say. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, absolutely, it's silver. Um, but um, let's say, I guess one bottle of that was about um, like a 150 ish dollar, at least in, in our experiment recently. Um, yeah. So it's absolutely more expensive than um, the the basic color, you know, catries. But yeah, it's in the market. And it works in the inkjet printers. It does. It works with just, just any inkjet printer. Yep. I mean, I have conductive pens, so it, that that part's not that incredible to me. It's the inkjet printer part because. They used to be so fussy. Okay, I'm showing my age here. But I remember when, gosh, I remember when inkjets, you couldn't put anything in them that didn't belong or they just destroyed themselves. <laughs> I think that's still true. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that, that's so true. And now here, I guess when I picked the, you know, Benz, it's a Benz sensor specifically, uh, I, I mentioned, you know, transferring it using tape, right? Mm -hmm. So... Um, now uh, we can, once we kind of transfer the, the printed traces, the conductive traces, we can kind of place it on top of you know, a variety of objects or materials, right? That means we can kind of start uh, embedding circuitry uh, onto those kind of, you know, everyday objects. Um, so, so that's kind of the context we, we wanted to kind of explore when we looked into um, using the inkjet printer with the silver ink technique with tape. And yeah, <laughs> bending sensor is one of those. Mm -hmm. And so I am just printing onto normal copy paper and then the tape, how does that, and then I tape onto the copy paper? How does the tape come into it? Oh, um, let me, let me clarify. So it does, it requires um, some, you know, once we kind of print out circuitry, it, it needs uh, some sintering process, but we, to avoid to kind of, um, how can I say that? Um, to shorten the path, we can use photo paper, you know, a bit like glossy ones that has a little bit of like a sticky texture on top of that. So we need to use uh, photo paper, first of all, instead of copy oh, paper. Copy paper, okay. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we can use any tape. Um, in our experiment, we used, um, you know, 3M tapes. Of, and under <laughs> the 3M tape, there are a variety of tapes that we can use. Some of tapes are water-soluble. Some of tapes are, you know, heat-resistive tape, right? Um, and anyway, using those tape we can transfer what's printed on those, you know, photo paper to the tape and then move it to somewhere else. This is a pretty specialized process. Um, can I also do this with copper tape myself or do I need to have an inkjet that I'm willing to put silver ink in? Actually, you know, copper tape, if we have copper tape, we can just... Um, you know, use the tape um, to any surfaces, any other materials. Um, so I guess that's cool as it is. Um, when I talk about, I guess, the transferring technique specifically, um, I, I imagine contexts like, you know, making a, a, a circuitry a bit more complex shape um, or on top of a bit transparent you know, surface such as window. Ooh. Uh, yeah, so those are kind of the context where we want to, you know, um, apply those tape-based methods. Okay. Um, so 
let's just skip to my project and what I want from these. We haven't even we haven't even established what we're talking about. We just haven't we? No, no, paper. we got stuck in lightning round and and and, and sensors. I think we're, we're, we started several levels <laughs> deep in the stack. No, no, we're we're, we're heading this direction. Okay, it's your show. <laughs> okay, so, are you guys together, dear? <laughs> oh yes. yes, we are together. We are. <laughs> okay. Um. So I do origami, and there's a special kind of origami from Tomoko Fuse's book, uh, Spirals, and they're coils, and they're remarkably like paper springs. They're mm-hmm. they're very fun to play with. Um, if I leave them around the house, Christopher just picks them up and then can't do anything else. Um, and when Chris and I judged the 2021 Maker Music Festival, we got to thinking about something with these coils that you could mash them down and then you'd get a tone and intensity depending on how far it was depressed. And I can make different coils uh, that would have different tones in sizes and colors and, and even springiness because I can control that with the paper. So how, how can I make my music thing? <laughs> Are you asking me? <laughs> yeah, I mean, okay, so... The paper ends up being kind of helical. Like when it's flat, I can put copper tape on it. Maybe I can print something or use a a plotter to use conductive ink and a pen. And I can print out one of the sensors that you, you have described. But I don't quite know... I suppose I I can fold one and then unfold one and then draw where things are, but how do I decide which sensor to use to build things? See, I was going somewhere. It wasn't a totally random question. I was headed somewhere. I can, I can imagine a variety of, you know, really fun interactions of (laughs) what you describe. Uh, Let's imagine um, how, how does that called, you know, the musical instrument that we kind of compress and release uh, um, to, to make a melody out of that a- accordion? Yeah, very accordion like uh, uh, paper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. something so, like that. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, in that case, you know, we, by, you know, um, doing that action, we just need to read the, the, the what's it, the deformation yes. level and the overall the action, right? So, um, all the possibilities you described applying conductive pen or tape. Um, we can, you know, um, read those, you know, actions by looking at the deformation level, because um, all of those, you know, conductive materials, in other words, those are electrically resistive materials, so that we can read all those um, deformation level out of them, right? Um, so I can imagine that kind of um, <laughs> musical instrument, and. Also, the other side of that, if you want to think about it more, kind of distinctive kind of melody out of the out of those paper sculpture, I guess. Um, there are many projects, really cool projects, making a um, lot of kind of what's that, uh, like a piano kind of you know instrument. People print them out on the wall. Um, or, you know, make it as a giant installation and uh, we can draw all of those uh, instruments. And at the same time, those drawing function just like piano, right? Or violin, I suppose. In this case, you know, we are kind of uh, reading where we are pressing it, right? So each of those kind of work just like a pressure or Mm. a push button. Um, And at the same time, we kind of need to then think about uh, output. Then, yeah, that's that's kind of the different side of the question, I guess. That is a harder side of the question to me because I the output side. mm -hmm. I think of that as easy side. That's just software. Well, I mean, you you probably put it into an analog input. Yeah, yeah. Because even the ones that are push button may not be over the threshold. So all of these end up working kind of like potentiometers or capacitor or, or, or variable capacitors? Yeah, any of those. What do you, yeah, most of the sensors, you're reading one of those properties, right? Mm-hmm. Well, 
in this page I have up that's nobody else can see. <laughs> um, Ayunju has this uh, different organization of different um, sensors, so that if you want to make a capacitive sensor, a capacitive touch sensor, it's a it's square, and if you you touch in the center of the square. Oh, okay. But if you want to make a uh, analog pressure one, you have copper tape that goes that zigzags with another piece of copper tape, and that that does a pressure in the direction you are okay. it, uh, perpendicular to the plane of the zigzags of the tape. Okay. And so that that lets you detect pressure. Um, and then she's got one up here that's about the analog flex, but. I'm not going to describe it because it's a very visual thing. And I've been told that that isn't appropriate for a podcast. <laughs> you have these, these five sensors uh, that I mentioned earlier. And are these, are these the only ones I can make out of paper? How do you make, I mean, is it just you put it on paper and it works? Yeah, I suppose. Um, but le le let me really... Um, start from kind of uh, higher level. Um, what? You want to back. start from the beginning? <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> what I'm saying is that um, that the whole techniques that we have used to make those each of those sensors, um, I wouldn't really claim uh, we, like my team, invented um, all of those. It, it's really existing technique and we our focus was really making it more uh, accessible and available um, specifically for the context of, you know, um, craft-based learning context for, uh, for middle school youth in that project. So um, what we did was, you know, looking at what's available techniques already in the field and see how we can make those more, you know, uh, understandable form and um, how we can make a kit of um, those kind of paper cards templates with craft-friendly, you know, uh, conductive and non-conductive materials and parts to support educators um, for inclusive, you know, CS, you know, um, education. <laughs> so using the kit, students can make their own sensors, and then adapt those sensors into their, you know, creative project, whatever they want to work on. Um, does it does it make sense? Yes, of course. I, I mean, I, I kind of knew you didn't invent the sensors, but <laughs> you're applying them in such an interesting way that makes it feel like I can understand this sensor in a way that I've never been able to understand it when I just buy something. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, I guess the, the transparency was the key. And um, we wanted to really start from, you know, even if the process would mean, you know, lowering the performance, of course, because it's not really, you know, uh, optimized form. Um, maybe starting from the lower level we can, you know, encourage students to see what's going on inside of the part so that they can kind of tinker with those kind of underlying phenomena and then make a design decision, you know, by making their own, let's say, you know, form factors to make perhaps, you know, like circle or star shape, like push button, and then, you know, adapt it into their project. I guess that, that was the key because, um, we wanted to show really um, what's going on inside of it. I guess that's the key. And then looking at how this process, starting from lower level, can invite them to be more, you know, um, creative and, and be more authentic, have more, you know, ownership, sense of ownership um, in their projects. And this isn't the first set of tools like this you've done another set <laughs> um yeah um i have worked on um this sort of project almost a decade <laughs> so but really uh, this project the direct motivation was from a project called paper mac 
uh, which I started as a PhD student a long time ago. And um, working on the project, the, all those, what we talked about before, you know, the paper-based mechanical, you know, sculptures, I loved what students made out of, you know, um, the working, you know, the working kinetic uh, creatures they make. And then on the process, what students added to automate their movement, to program their movement, was um, servo motor with a microcontroller. And then over time, I realized, in fact, students didn't, understand how a motor really works you know uh, although we talked about it in in many workshops it was invisible what's going on inside of the servo motor really a motor itself was invisible because it's you know packaged right it's all kind of um, pre-assembled so um, I guess from certain point um, that's where, you know, I got bothered and then I wanted to kind of make something from lower level. So in other words, even if it doesn't really generate enough torque and even if it doesn't really make a great movement, uh, I wanted to start from, you know, showing, you know, electromagnetic phenomena, what's going on inside of the motor and, and students can, um, you know, start from there and, and make something that move from, from lower level. Um, it's kind of sneak peek. So following work would be kind of actuation side of it. So far in, in this, you know, paper card project, we only explored sensor card sensors, but we are also looking at now the actuation side of it because of the reason I just mentioned. Wait a minute. The, the sensors came first? I actually thought that the paper mech came first. Yes. So paper mech came first. Okay. And, and, and that's where I got motivated um, and then started this project. But sensors are easier to teach and easier to um, make a, a kit. So uh, that's why we started from sensor side of it, to kind of initiate the, the overall platform, I suppose. And I have a, an off-the-wall question here. What's the difference between mechatronics and robotics? Um, I don't know. And I guess better answer is, I don't care. <laughs> 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 <In my work. laughs> mechatronics sounds cooler. That's all. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so your site is papermech.net. Uh, mm-hmm. And when I click on Fold Mecca, I I see a bunch of different um, mechanisms. There's there's a things like I may want to do. I may want to open and close something. I may want to have something go up and down. I may want to flap like a bird, or I may want to rotate. And then when I click on one of those, like the up and down, it then shows me the gear, the rack and pinion, and how it works. And then if I keep clicking around here, it's going to lead me to something I can print out and put on cardboard and make my own rack and pinion. And and I guess the first question is, why aren't you charging for this? It's genius. It's so cool. <laughs> I have never understood these things as well as I do right now because I can I can really see how they work. Thank you. I, I really appreciate it. And um, <laughs> why would I need to charge for that? So that project was, um, you know, initiated under um, NSF, um, National Science Foundation Fund. And that the whole project um, supported my PhD study as well as it, the overall, you know, project team. So um, I guess we considered you know, we've got enough, (laughs) a lot, and we wanted to make something really shareable with the community. Uh, When I made those available in the web, uh, at the beginning, I didn't think um, people would really, you know, get to use it, really. Um, I, 
I kind of made it available in the web as a, really for selfish reason. <laughs> um, I made it for my portfolio. And then over the time, I, you know, because I have shared it in, you know, uh, several kind of conferences and, and media, I noticed that some people started using it and then talked about, you know, those are usable. <laughs> and then that was, you know, that, that was beyond where we started at the beginning. But, and we really appreciate it and wanted to kind of make things better because we could see that, um, you know, people are using it. Um, yeah, that's where, you know, that has continued and we keep working on it. Now the, the project is done and there's no more kind of NSF fund or whatever, but because the, the overall project team, um, just love where it's going um, and we can see the community is growing. Um, we are just working on it as, as our kind of lifelong hobby project, I guess. And in addition to showing me how spur gears work in planetary gears, you have a gallery of things people have done with it, little puppets and moving widgets um, some of which are clearly done by kids, uh, some of which look more professionally designed. Do you have any favorites of any of your gallery? <laughs> um, I love all of those. And you should know that um, those are already kind of selected in the list. But I love those um, made by kids. I love those kind of looking more incomplete, um, have very specific and detailed, you know, storyline. I love them. Uh, there's one here that's an up and down application showing the rack and pinion, and it has a mm-hmm. um, it has a groundhog, maybe a groundhog, something that looks animalish. Mm-hmm. behind some grass <laughs> and it's just so cute because it's popping up and then popping down and it really led to me thinking oh what else can I do if I can just print out all the parts and add a motor and a power support su- power supply maybe a microcontroller so I could have it do it at different times or different timings <laughs> it really kind of made my imagination go oh, that's an afternoon's worth of project, not a year's worth of learning. Was that part of your goal? Yes, that's exactly part of the goal. And um, I wanted to kind of make them look something kind of inspiring, but in a way they feel they can also make something like that. You know, people can feel oh, that looks so fun, but not in a way, you know, we, we kind of admire um, someone uh, in, in a gallery kind of context. Like, um, you know, when, when somebody looks so high, <laughs> we feel like, oh my God, they're they they, they they are just too far from my reality. You know what I'm saying? But in this case, I wanted to make them look specifically kind of something like we can also, um, you know, imitate or follow or make my own version. Absolutely. This jumping T-Rex, I have to say <laughs> the, the, the finish quality is perhaps a little lower, but the girl talking about it is completely awesome. And just watching yeah. it, it work kind of like how she wanted, but not entirely was pretty fun. Do, do you, um, how often do you get to try them out with kids? Um, I think at least, at least once or twice a year, um, I work with kids. Yeah. Do you wish it was more or is that about right? Um, given my reality, (laughs) other side (laughs) of my job, I think that's, um, yeah, that's pretty much, you know, what I can handle. Do you also work with more professional designers? Yes, I do. Tell me more, please. (laughs) Well, um, so my group works with a broad range of designers, starting from um, K-12 
students and educators to you know hobbyist makers and design students to professional designers in the field and um what we really um, focus on is how you know a set of technologies we build can support them um, in their creative exploration both in expressive and technical sides um so um, the specific way we kind of start from is looking at what they are already familiar with, you know, somehow in you know, accessible context and or materials around them. So when we work with advanced designers, it means we look at the tools, objects, materials, or even further, like practices and cultures they are familiar with. Um, and then see you know, what meaningful, you know, additions we can make to enable them for new kinds of, you know, making activities for, you know, um, um, different kinds of learning possibilities. What are the main differences working with the kids versus working with the professional designers? (laughs) Or what are the main similarities? (laughs) (laughs) I see. So, the main differences would be, um, I think, the kinds of challenges are different, um, and the overall, you know, the scope of familiarity, the scope of accessibility in terms of what I mentioned, tools, objects, materials, those are different. Um, let's say uh, what I mentioned. Um, earlier in terms of kind of using, um, let's say, Inksaprinter with Silver Ink. Those are kind of things I believe uh, people in the DIY technology community uh, already kind of have seen that and have used it for a while. So for them, that is, you know, um, you know familiar and accessible context already. And um, if we use some other tools as uh, examples like 3D printers, or laser cutters, um, they are familiar with those kind of tools, right? So we can kind of start from that re- that level. But when we talk about kind of K-12, um, or like working with children, um, from their perspective, those are, you know, what they have heard of, but they, are, they haven't really experienced those tools yet. So... Um, we cannot really use them as, as a starting point to open up their mind. And, and I guess here I'm trying to highlight um, the, the, um, what's the familiarity and accessibility um, a, as a key mechanism to open up their mind because, um, because we are looking at really, you know, supporting their creative exploration side um, I believe without having that that uh, familiar and accessible context, it is really hard to open up their mind, and it is really hard to kind of see the culture of you know can do mindset, right? So um, yeah, I guess how we can define the scope of familiarity and, and accessibility; those are you know different depending on who we work with. And back to the uh, back to your questions in terms of similarity, I think um, because we work with a broad range of designers, uh, we see a lot of similarities um, how they really strive to be more creative, and um, we look at the technologies we design to be tools eventually. Mm. So. Um, people use them to kind of navigate, you know, um, their journey eventually. So um, we just want to kind of see uh, how they want to navigate their creative journey and what are the kind of close link across, you know, what they make, how they think, you know, how they learn. Uh, I guess that's the key and, and the similarity on the line there, like a striving to, to be more creative, to be more expressive 
add one more layer uh, in terms of kind of the technical capacity of their kind of storytelling. Um, I think those are kind of common desires across all levels of designers. That's the answer to your question. That was a great <laughs> answer. Um, one of the things I liked about some of the videos was the storytelling aspect. Mm-hmm. And with professional designers, I would think that many of them come in with a thought and just want to know how to make it work, where the students see how something work and then build a thought around the mechanism they're learning. Do you find that to be true or is that just my imagination? Mm, yeah. Yeah, so overall tendency is uh, what you mentioned. I would say students really come with, kind of younger students come with um, curiosity, what they would learn, and then think about, you know, how they would adapt it into, you know, their storytelling, whereas more um, trained, advanced level of designers kind of come with their ideas and want to learn um, more of, um, kind of new technical possibility, I suppose. But at the same time, I guess um, really inspiring um, materials and techniques and tools, um, even experienced designers can really open up their mind really and step back and think about um, think about you kind know, of broader possibilities when they encounter, inspiring kind of tool sets and that's why um, again I'm really looking at uh, what they are somehow familiar and accessible to in their practices because it, it's it kind of builds up the context people can be people's mind can be more flexible I feel I I, I totally agree with you it because even just looking at, you know, the planetary gears and, and thinking, thinking, oh, what could I do with this? Or what could I do with this and origami? Can I mix them? It just, it, it makes my brain fizz. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you mentioned getting NSF grants for these. Is it for mm-hmm. the technology? Is it for the education aspect what are the grants for um i guess the the grant you're talking about was uh, under the the paper mac um, and that was proposed as a you know new medium for engineering education um that was proposed by my phd advisor mike Einsberg and, and sherry she and um Really, paper mech is a, is a short word of paper mechatronics. Um, that that's kind of the what we proposed in the in the NSF proposal uh, as, as a new design medium combining traditional paper crafting with mechanical, electrical, and computational components. And there we talked about how such combinations um, can bring up you know, such an expanded scope of creative possibilities and those how those could be kind of new um, creative and educational medium for engineering um, for the ne- next generation. And in that context, we, uh, we talked about kind of developing a set of techniques and new tools um, yeah, and under there, the, the simulator that we talked about, Foldmeca, came out. And um, what what we can do using, you know, once people download the PDF file and cut the cut the parts to make their own things, um, you know, the, the website also shows a set of assembly technique. Um, those also came out of that grant. And really, I don't need a motor to make any of this work, do I? I could just use a straw and turn it myself. Exactly. That's that's just so true. And we actually um, started exploring it around the end of 
you know, the project period, because at the beginning, um, we focused on, you know, what we can, what would be the newly enabled possibilities when you put things all together. Um, in other words, because it was kind of proposed as a new new STEM learning medium, we wanted to include kind of some of mechanical components, some of electrical components, some of computational components in in the context of paper crafting. So it was intentionally kind of added um, to have some of programming and uh, circuit building. That makes sense. It's a different way to introduce people to these topics. Yeah, but your um, idea was, it really makes sense. And we started looking at it actually after um, after three to four years of the, the early investigation, because as we started working with public school teachers, um, you know, teachers talked about all the, the real world, you know, challenges, how, you know, it's, it's hard to kind of uh, support all those um, physical computing parts, you know, motors and, and teaching programming with those. So um, we kind of looked back and started adding, you know, individual elements so that some of our teachers can also use some of, you know, um, I don't know, like different kinds of craft teachers can also use our materials because, you know, really it's, we wanted to um, talk about in a higher level creativity, you know, creative learning possibilities for all the fields. So um, what you suggested totally makes sense. You said you are going to be teaching a course called Designing for Creativity? Designing for curiosity. <laughs> Designing for curiosity, even better. Um, c- can you c- can you give us the course right now? Because I, I kind of want to do it. And, and so if you could just go through all the semester or quarter's worth of information right now, that would be great. Maybe a summary? Uh, <laughs> um, t- Designing for curiosity is a, is a class I... Um, designed after joining Georgia Tech. Um, it's a class to use curiosity as a medium to uh, practice um, designing interactions for people and looking at um, how we can make people think and change actions and um, um, how we can also kind of look back what changes our actions, what impacts our thinking processes, um, all those kind of, you know, (laughs) invisible aspects of thinking process, and then adapt it into a tangible and visible side of, you know, our our project. So curiosity here is um, I... I propose the curiosity more as a medium, literally, to inspire students, especially design students. I have a couple of listener questions. Mm -hmm. Uh, The first, do you have any book recommendations that might detail a few of the mechanical designs and talk about how and why they work? The classical book would be, you know, um, 507 Mechanical Movements. Um, have that one. Mm-hmm. You have that one. I I love that book. It's really classic. The classic works, still works, right? Um, it works for me because I'm I, I see myself really visual learner, and and bottom up approach really works better for me. And uh, looking at those very detailed, you know, all the variety of combinations. Um, I kind of, you know, at the end of it, I can see more of the, the essence, the fundamental side of, you know, how machines work, how each component work. Um, if I add one more, um, for the same reason, but completely different, you know, seemingly different approach, would be Rob Ibis, um, the uh, 
um, he is in, I guess, UK, uh, in, in designer paper artists, paper designer. So he makes all variety of, you know, paper model, paper automata models. And he also has published many, many books. Yes. Um, paper automata. Uh, that's mm-hmm. what these things are often called. Isn't it the automata word? I think so. Yes, paper automata or paper paper um, um, kinetic sculpture, something like that. Yeah. How did you come to this? Did you did you start with the research idea of okay, we want to explore how to make uh, design creativity and curiosity uh, easier or or more approachable? And then the materials presented themselves as, oh, this this would be a good set of things to try to work with, or were you already interested in uh, working with these materials and went the other way? I'm from art and design background. I studied art in, in Seoul, Korea. Um, like all my teenage years, I, I was in art school. So paper has been one of the you know most comfortable kind of medium I can kind of play with. Um, during my thinking pro- throughout my thinking process, and um, as an art student, I have admired you know many of kind of genius <laughs> artists, and one of them included um, Theo Janssen. Theo Janssen is um, um, if you look up kind of uh, what's that uh, strand beast. You can see the whole, you know, kind of uh, giant <laughs> um, machine walking on the beach. Um, and, oh, the strand walker. Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, there he is. And I have admired him such a long time. And I was uh, also in one of his exhibitions in Korea before coming to the state. I think it was 2009 or 10. Um, and so admiring him many years, um, it, it was it was there, but it didn't really occur to me. It didn't really inspire me to feel like, you know, I can also make something like that because it's just so far from <laughs> my yeah. reality. Yeah. And it, it looked just so fantastic. But at the same time, you know, it didn't seem I can also make something like that. But then um, in my first summer as a PhD student, uh, one of my PhD advisors, Mike Eisenberg, showed me a YouTube video named Kinetic Paper Horse. Um, nowadays, you know, when we search paper, Kinetic Paper Horse, we can see a bunch of different ones as well. But that time they, they had a um, very interesting paper kit, um, clearly kind of... Um, kind of representing the, the Janssen mechanism, but it's made of paper and it looked very incomplete. Um, it was a motor powered version. And looking at that one, I guess it was 2014. And I, I guess it was my first time ever I felt, oh my God, I think I can also make something like that. Although, you know, it's much more, you know, humble version of that. It really didn't matter for me. Um, I just wanted to make my own version. So I jumped into, you know, my um, prototyping <laughs> right there, right at that, you know, afternoon and spent whole week to make my own version and I made it. And on the process, um, I realized that mechanism was much harder than I expected. So it took absolutely more time than I expected. But I spent days and nights to make my own version because I was just so engaged. And um, throughout the experience, um, you know, I I was just so into kind of making things that move. And I started understanding, you know, investigating different kind of relevant mechanical movements. And I learned so much during that week. Um, so later on, um, I kind of added the motor and I kind of connected it to um, microcontroller step by step so that I can kind of learn 
um, better about circuit building as well and then programming the motor as well. And I learned just so much. And then stepping back after the week, um, in the conversation with the advisors, I, we, we were talking about, you know, how these sort of activities can, you know, be a strong means for others too, for their learning and how this kind of whole process can invite all of us to have so much fun on top of all. So, um, that's where I started kind of making tools, making something others can also follow up and inspire them to come up with something like that, but in their own version. And you have the Jensen mechanism in your list and you have a video of a four-legged uh, Jensen, Jensen uh, mechanism walking with, mm-hmm. uh, which is, I mean, kind of amazing. How long would it take me to build that? I just, just out of curiosity for, for the weekend. Oh, I think <laughs> you can just spend one, um, I think afternoon to make it, but I would say four hours, um, would absolutely. Yeah. Do I need a laser cutter to cut the cardboard? No. Okay. No. You don't need to. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, have, you cut out actual circles. I have a machine that will cut <laughs> out circles for me. So that's good because I couldn't do that part. But I am amazed to look at this little little guy walking around made of cardboard and a couple of sticks and a couple of motors. Yeah. And nowadays there are many kind of, um, what is it, the, the desktop plotter machines, uh, the yeah. cutting tools. So we can also use them. Yeah. Yeah. I have a Cricut. It's very handy. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's also my favorite. I do weird origami on it. <laughs> <laughs> do uh, one more question from Nathan. Do you have preferred construction materials, fasteners, cutting, and gluing tools? Like eight questions. Well, yes, of course. But uh, the construction mechanism, cardboard, copy paper. Um, I always start with you know, copy paper, just because it's, you know, around us all the time, um, especially used copy paper, because I don't have to have guilty, um, you know, related notes. Whenever I do workshop, um, either with kids or, you know, uh, university students, I try to use recycle materials, um, not just because it's cheap, but also because it can reduce their fear about failure um, so any of recycled, you know, discarded materials really help. So discarded cardboard, uh, water bottles, soda bottles, uh, paper cups, you know, copy paper, all of those. Whenever I schedule a workshop, um, I start kind of collecting those <laughs> for the workshop. That makes sense. Chris, do you have any questions? Uh, yes, thousands. Um, yeah, I'm. I'm in that boat too. If listeners are interested in playing around with this stuff, uh, is there a good starting point? Is it just go to Paper Mac, or um, do you have other recommended kind of beginner material or learning materials that that you could point people to? Paper Mac can be one way, but really making something even seemingly very trivial, making something. Um, can help. Okay. Just starting something, doing something can can help. Um, and then kind of back to what I mentioned, um, using the materials you 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 don't need to kind of have guilty about failure. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's the great thing about it is is a lot of with a lot of the projects that that we talk to people about, it's you know electronics based, and you have to get boards and learn how to communicate with software and things and motors and all all the mechanical side. The mechanical side is one of the things that's most intimidating to me. Um, Whenever I have a project that involves anything mechanical, I just stop because I have to either figure out, you know, oh, okay, I've got to learn to do CAD. Okay. If I learn to do CAD, then I've got to figure out how to 3D print these things. But this, this seems like something that's really approachable that, okay, if I have an idea for something mechanical, I can at least start here and it costs Mm -hmm. me basically nothing 
except some time and like you say, copy paper, which is <laughs> not, not very, uh, not very difficult uh, yeah. to come by. So I, it never occurred to me to, to, to start playing around with mechanical ideas this way. And I think it's really, really a very, very cool thing. Thank you. I, I feel a lot of just overall, you, you talked about, you know, mechanical stuff. Um, yes, because, you know, it's about whether it works or not. Right. Um, and I think just overall, how the, the traditional STEM field works um, because it seems, you know, um, <laughs> it requires very accurate <laughs> and planned approach. We feel, you know, uh, more distance, I guess. Um, and that's why, you know, a lot of this kind of craft-based approach try to um, show different ways of entry um, to, yeah. to kind of invite them step by step. Yeah. I think that's important because there are people who come at it from the perspective of, let's just try stuff. Let's try it all. Push all the buttons. And then there are people who come at it from a, okay, I, I believe in the scientific method and I think we should do this one step at a time. And sometimes, sometimes you want skills in the other direction. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm thinking that we should we should you know clear out the living room, put a couple giant cardboard boxes down, and just play. Okay. <laughs> this afternoon is about being four year olds. Yeah. Well, I um, I really think, regardless of um, you know discipline differences. Um, because there are many disciplines associated with what we call creativity, right? Some of those uh, would be kind of mechanical engineering, what we are talk about, what we are talking about, and art, you know, design, craft, um, engineering, uh, even computer science. All of those, um, I believe, there is a common ground across all of those fields, and. Some of those common ground should include, you know, what we are talking about, curiosity and, and kind of um, messing up, <laughs> doing it, right? making it, inventing. So all of those really apply to, I think, all the fields we are talking about. Well, I feel that this might be a little redundant, but hi and ju it's been great to talk to you. Do you have any thoughts you'd like to leave us with? I think I talked a lot. <laughs> um, I, I think I talked a lot. Um, maybe just back to what we already mentioned, um, making something even you know, seemingly trivial can, can give all of us joy in our everyday life, I'll say. <laughs> so let's um, spend more time on, on making stuff. Our guest has been Professor Hyun Ju Oh, the director of the Code Craft Group, and an assistant professor with a joint appointment in the School of Industrial Design and the School of Interactive Computing at Georgia Tech. Her site is codecraft.group, where you can find out a lot more information. And don't forget the papermech.net, which I had a lot of fun playing on. So I am looking forward to seeing more about those sensors and other new projects. Thanks, Yunju. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you to Christopher for producing and co-hosting. Thank you to Leigh Buckley for in our introduction and to our Patreon listener Slack group for questions. Of course, thank you for listening. You can always contact us at show at embedded.fm or hit the contact link on Embedded FM. And now a quote to leave you with from Theo Jansen. The walls between art and engineering exist only in our minds. <laughs>